I'm uh, Dr. Pete Nicholas, and it's my pleasure today to have with me uh, two very distinguished people. Uh, I have with me uh, Antigone Lefteris Ladd and Dr. Dean Griffin. Uh, Dr. Griffin is a very familiar face around Westminster. He's been treating people in Westminster for, for many years, and uh, he's a retired physician and a Phil Helene, as we call him. Uh, Antigone, <clears throat> who has her roots here in Westminster and now lives in Gettysburg, uh, is the uh, editor of a uh, soon to be uh, very uh, notorious book, as far as notoriety <laughs> goes, and it is called the, uh, uh, the, the Greek Families of Westminster, Maryland. If you hold that up at the camera there, Antigone. Okay. <clears throat> um, this was cre this uh, stemmed from a project uh, that was started uh, when two years ago. We? It took two years. Two years to start this project, and uh, I want to know how this project. It, it, it was, this, was, this was something that was begun here in Westmer, Westminster. Started basically at I guess Harry's restaurant, you could say, and uh, it culminated in the publication of a book that. I think is second to none as far as geneal genealogy and, and heritage is concerned. So the first thing I wanted to ask is, um, Dr. Griffin, if you don't mind me calling you Dean, I would appreciate it. Please do. I just wanted to ask, uh, how, how did this project come about? Well, and why are you here today? There's a reason. <clears throat> Pete, you got to remember that uh, I grew up in this community. And the Greeks that we're talking about today are either the children or grandchildren of the, the Greeks that are the basis of our book. And, well, I guess I should start with the, uh, the Cyrenaikos and Praises uh, family we were, my wife and I were good friends of that family, and, and uh, one day I had stopped and had coffee with Zoe, and Zoe started to tell me stories about life in Greece and her life in Greece and how they had come to this country, and then her father took them back to Greece, and, and they could not get out due to World War II, and then came back after the war. But the stories went on and on and on. And I said, Zoe, has this ever been written? Has anybody ever put this down in writing? I said, this is history. And she said, no, we've talked about it. The, the, my children seem to be very much interested in it, and we really should do that. So I said, well, why don't we do that? And talked about what we could do. So shortly after that, we got together a list of people that we knew that were around in the area and uh, invited them to meet with us at uh, Harry's lunch and discuss whether there would be any interest in these people talking about their family and putting uh, this material together in a, in a booklet or book fashion. I am not a writer, uh, I admit it, but because I had talked about it, I thought, well, push come to shove, I'll do what I can, and then maybe we can find somebody to edit it and uh, come up with uh, a, P, a booklet that would be informative and, and good to have. So that's, that's essentially how it started. We met, and do you want me to go on with the rest of that story, or? Sure, I mean, you know. Well. You could say how, how the ball was passed on to I'm Antigone. going to, yeah. yeah. So we met at, at Harry's lunch, and uh, the first meeting was not very productive. It reminded me of my uh, my big fat Greek wedding movie that Hollywood put out where everybody was uh, jabbering around and exchanging stories and and laughter and arguing and uh, 
I thought, whoa. So got through that one and then set a date for the second meeting. And uh, that was somewhat like the first. Well, by the third meeting, I thought, we got to do something. You know, we got to get this thing rolling. But the third meeting was just like the first two. But as it neared time to break up, out of the crowd came this woman, Antigone Lefteris Ladd, whose parents had a uh, small grocery store on Main Street in Westminster when I was a kid. And I would stop on the way home from school or something and maybe pick up a soda or, or candy bar or something like that. <clears throat> but that was on Main Street, and they would they told me I, as a, as patients, they uh, kept telling me what a talented daughter they had. You know, everybody likes to talk about their kid, and so I just I did not know Antigone. I knew who she was, but to know her, know her, I did not. And, but it turned out that she she had done a small portion of her family history here. And the rest of the group just sat around in awe as she distributed this and, and got their attention. And they thought, man, if that's what she's talking about, let's get busy. So from then on, they, we had productive meetings. They brought, uh, they would bring pictures and artifacts and and all kinds of things to these meetings. And at that time, we were very fortunate. We had Zoe Ampraises, Cyrenakis, with us. And Zoe was a bit older than any of us, and she knew all of these people. And uh, she was also quite capable in uh, translating letters and looking at pictures and saying, well, this is so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. And so. She knew them all, all of, of the people that were here in this country and many of them that, uh, from Greece. So with, with the combination of our leader, Antigone Left Harris Ladd, this project got off and, uh, and Zook, Zoe interpreting uh, was a big benefit also to the group, and rest is history. Yeah. Uh, so, how, why did you want to put yourself through this self abuse? <laughs> I mean, in all sincerity, it's a big project to undertake, especially when you're among Greeks. Because as you know, when you have two Greeks in a room, you got at least three or four arguments. Exactly. And that's literally what had happened at the first meeting was that the people that Dr. Griffin and Zoe pulled together were people who hadn't seen each other for years. Because the Greek community now of the ones that I grew up with are scattered in Annapolis, in, I'm in Gettysburg, we have people in uh, North Carolina, we have California. people in Florida, California. So because of his name and reputation, he was the doctor to most of our families anyway. So when he called me, I said, yes, sir, I'm coming. We got together and we couldn't stop talking because we hadn't seen each other for so long. It was total chaos. Where I got started was that a couple years before that, I had found a trunk with World War II letters in it. And they were from my uh, parents on both sides of the family. My mother had two brothers in World War II, one in India and one in the D-Day landings. My father's side of the family had my father in the military and his older brother who was sent to the Pacific where he served in surgery. And I learned about a project called the Veterans History Project which accepted World War II letters and letters from any wars. Um, if you turn over the originals to them, they will preserve them forever. And I thought, Uncle Bill had no children. What a wonderful thing. So I started with him. He was also my dearest uncle and I just, he, he practically raised us. We had such a good time with him. I thought, what a tribute to him to save his letters. 
And I got wrapped up in the project and took it overboard. I not only read the letters, I typed them all and then inserted explanations of who the people were that he was referring to and then took all of his photo albums and put the pictures in with them. So then I circulated that to all of our family members so they could have Uncle Bill's letters. That got me into Uncle Bill's personal history. I forgot that he had come over here as a 12-year-old kid to live in Westminster with his uncle and be raised here in the United States. So my father came uh, later. He was in his 20s when he came. But Uncle Bill was a 12-year-old. And there was, and I brought it with me today, there was Uncle Bill's visa. This is the passport that the poor young man had. It was uh, this size. This is actually a copy of it. But uh, it's in French and in Greek and has a picture of this little scared 12-year-old kid who would come to Westminster and grow up here. As I read his World War II letters, they were not only touching about what he's going through and how he cared about the family, but in one of the letters he says, I've seen so much of the world as I've traveled around because he went from um, army bases in Virginia to the Midwest, to the West. He ends up in Oakland, California, and then goes to Australia, and then to New Guinea, which were, is where he uh, worked in the surgery for most of the time. He said, I've seen so much of the world, I don't know if I'll return to Westminster. Maybe I'll find a home and, and start over and, and do something new. But he came back after World War II, he settled here, and aren't we lucky because he helped raise us so my parents, uh, Arthur and Tula left Terrace, and Bill left Terrace, my uncle, were like three parents to us. That's how close we were. So as a tribute to Uncle Bill, I did my absolute best before I turned the letters over to the Library of Congress. So when Dr. Griffin said, we're going to do family histories, I'd go, I've got one already. So he said, Dr. Griffin suggested, we go back and find the first person in our family to come. Well, I'm going, that's not Uncle Bill. He was brought over by his uncle. So I have to, then I had to start and dig out Uncle Tom Ambrazes, who came over, it turns out, in 1904. And that led me on a study to um, figure out what brought him here, because Dr. Griffin kept saying, why would they come? And there's the crux of the issue that we had to deal with, all of the 10 families that ended up writing the book. Why would somebody in Greece want to come to a little town in Maryland? They never, Westminster doesn't show up on a map of the United States uh -huh. when you're looking at it from Greece. So we had to trace them all the way back, and none of us had any genealogical background. We learned by just diving in. So after Dr. Griffin got us started, and I did the first example, I brought it into the group, and I said, here's my Uncle Tom. I checked him all the way back to when he came. What do you think? I waited for people to say, that's wonderful. We're going to do the same. What they said was, now that you did that one, when are you going to start on mine? I thought, uh-oh, now we're in trouble. But I realized most people don't like to write. So I said, why don't I come to each family one by one, and I'll bring a tape recorder. You get the documents out. You find the photographs. You get the photo albums, tell me who these people are, and I'll, at least if there's one person doing the editing, then you can have a similar format. So it's not going to be everybody writing whatever they wanted. So we had a consistent format. And that was my plan. And it took two years. What is interesting is that I was thinking about it on the way in today. Why did we get it done in two years? How long does it take most people to do genealogical research? It takes them years and years and years. That's where the support of Dr. Griffin and Zoe Sirinaikis paid off in spades. They called a meeting once a month. And every time our energy was flagging and we said, I don't want to do this. This doesn't make any sense. There are no names on the back of the pictures. I don't know who these people are. I don't know when the pictures were taken. Don't ask me what date it is. I don't know anything. I'm third generation. Dr. Griffin calls up and says, hi, we're having a meeting. Why don't you all come? And he would pick us up and cheer us up. And we would end up leaving those meetings re-energized and wanting to go back and dig up stuff that we had never tried before. 
It was an amazing process. Every time we fell down, he'd pick us up again. And Zoe turned out to be the biggest resource of all because she had been born in Westminster, went back to Greece in the 1930s, lived there until World War II started, and then her father couldn't get the family back, so they had to stay in Greece during the war. She knew all of my relatives because we are, she's cousin to my father, so she knew my great-grandparents, whom I had never seen pictures of, didn't know their names, didn't know anything. And so all of the letters that I have and all of the stories that I have, Zoe translated and gave me another generation to my family. So I owe her the biggest debt of all. But it was Dr. Griffin who kept us going because we would have fallen on our noses. Nobody here professionally knew how to do any research. And we had to learn by helping each other every time we got stuck. Well, that's pretty amazing. Um, that really, really is very, very amazing. It's a very professional work. Um, and have you yourself, but prior to this, have you gone and done any genealogical research online or, you know? I, I learned with this project. You learned with this project. And that's, I think that's how we all did it. And we found resources. The good news is Dr. Griffin and his wife work with the Historical Society here in Carroll County. And he brought to the first meeting a lady named Mimi Ashcraft, who is a volunteer there. And Mimi became my, I, I felt like I was handicapped sometimes. I'd just call her up on a Saturday and say, Mimi, I'm stuck, what do I do? She always guided us into new resources that we could find. She put us in touch with a resource that I would like to thank everybody for, which is the Carroll County Genealogical Society. I didn't even know the group existed. She said the, um, the state of Maryland a couple years back decided that all the county courthouses had to have their records sent to Maryland to be put in their new big state archives. And so all of the naturalization records, if your father or my father, and my father did, uh, get his naturalization here at the Carroll County Courthouse and had to have witnesses and all the record keeping done, all of that would be gone and would be in Annapolis, and we'd have to go there and, and dig it up. The Genealogical Society in Carroll County said, before they go, let's Xerox all of them. They Xerox the genealogical records. They are in two boxes at the public library. Mimi directed me to uh, Ann Horvath, who gave me the boxes to look at, and I found not 10 Greek families, I found 16 Greek families. We found families that had come before us and after us and who had been through the naturalization process and we didn't even know about them. But more importantly, I found things in there about my own family that I could not find on the internet and I couldn't find in the newspaper archives. Carroll County Times archives are wonderful, but the naturalization papers, I found Uncle Tom's record of when he arrived, the name of the ship, Try to imagine yourself doing, well, you know, genealogical research by going through the Ellis Island records. How badly can they screw up a Greek name when somebody comes over and he's muttering in another language and you're muttering in English? Our, our names have been botched famously. The Genealogical Society had the records of the actual naturalization papers that were filed and one of the things that's required is before you get your citizenship, the federal government will check the name of the ship you came in on and verify it and certify it and send it back to the county courthouse. So I got the actual arrival dates of all the Greek families that had been naturalized here. I found Uncle Tom's marriage date. I didn't know that. I had looked everywhere for it in Pennsylvania where his wife was from and in Maryland where Uncle Tom lived, still couldn't find it. The reason was he was married in Atlantic City, New Jersey. That's on his naturalization certificate. So those records gave us data that we had been looking for randomly and wildly on the internet, and there they were sitting in the library. So thank you, Genealogical Society. I love you big time. Okay, that's, that's a very good resource to know about, which I wouldn't know about it. No. And, you know, it's like, uh, one of these little treasures that's hidden. Absolutely. And so um, I think it's great. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention to you, you know, this is really, really quite an accomplishment because I always say, 
Um, the Greeks never unite unless it's a crisis <laughs> or there's someone exceptional. Uh, they united in the fifth century BC against the Persians. Uh, they reunited against in the fourth century BC under Alexander the Great. And then they reunited again to overthrow the, uh, their Ottoman suppressors, who they had been under for 500 years. And they reunited again, of course, in, the, in two world wars. But it's rare. And I don't know, you've really accomplished a lot. Believe me, I, I, I really mean that. Well, this is our cheerleader. Yeah, God bless go. him. I know, I know, I know. You I know. united 10 families, <laughs> Dr. Griffin. That is a miracle of and by itself. 10 Greek families. Yeah. 10 Greek families, excuse That's right. me. The other thing I wanted to ask you is this. Uh, <clears throat> I have never been in a restaurant run by a Greek that was not great. And I mean that. I think it's... Uh, you know, and I really do mean that. I mean, anywhere I've gone, it seems like Greeks know how to eat. That's it. We really do know, you know, we, we love food and everything like that, and we know how to prepare it, and there's just something about serving a guest. So uh, tell us about, uh, well, let me put it to you this way. In, in Westminster, for example, what would you say was the number one occupation of the Greeks that came here? Well, we were surprised that there were, they were not all restaurants because we have doctors and lawyers now and we have um, the first Greek business in town was a hat cleaning and shoeshine parlor. But yes, the majority would go into the food business. Yeah. And my guess on that, and I'm not an expert on the historic, the uh, historical society is working with us to do some uh, immigration studies. The food business is risky anyway, but it is one that is not dependent on product. It's dependent on labor. So if you are willing to work long, hard hours and put in the time and effort yourself and run it with your family, then your hours will ultimately pay off. It is not like having a factory and you're making a product and then suddenly the product is out of fashion. Food is always food but it's dependent on, on the, your willingness to work hard. And that is one thing our ancestors came over here and were willing to do. I mean, they came and they worked in the text, my, uh, several of my relatives worked in the textile mills in New Hampshire, but then they got into the food business and once they were in, they stayed and they, they made fortunes and put their children through college. So there must be a way of making it pay off. Can I interject a couple things? Wow. One of the things that Antigone mentioned is their willingness to work. And this always impressed me that having these Greek friends, they worked hard. They'd, they'd go to the restaurant, for example, at 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning and close at 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night and be back on their feet getting ready to serve breakfast in the morning. Uh, not only that, did they work hard, but when they took time off, uh, it was quality time with their children. It was quality time with the family. That always impressed me. And even, even uh, the celebrations, the Easter celebrations and so forth, was very much directed to the young people in the family. Uh, and, and a lot of symbolism. And today, in my family, because of my association or my family's association with the, the, the Greeks, we still carry some of the custom, the Greek custom, and do them in, in my home. So yes, they worked hard, but they had quality time with their family. And, and you can see it all through the Greek community. Uh, in the book, uh, I was flipping through the other day, and it, it talked about one family who was very much music-oriented. And then on the weekend, <laughs> they had music, and they partied, they danced, they worked hard, they played hard. So that, that was always very, very impressive to me, that uh, the way they managed themselves and managed the, their families. The other point I wanted to make was that in this project, as we were moving along, someone mentioned that, that everybody 
on, in our group had a college degree or had the opportunity to go to college. And I can only think of one that maybe did not finish school, but I'm pretty sure that he had a few years of college under, under his belt. That, uh, and I, th I always thought that was great that they came over here, they worked hard, but they wanted their children to have that education. They knew the value of an education. So that's always been number one in the Greek culture. Uh, I, if, I, I, forgive me if I'm wrong on this, but from what I can gather statistically, <coughs> the Greek American has been number one in educating their children. Education has always been first. And that's, um, that's always something. <sighs> I was always taught, my father was a steel worker. He had to work because of hard times after the Second World War and, and what he had to do for his family. I am a third, uh, third generation, uh, let me see here, First, I'm second generation American. My grandparents came over from Greece and I just remember for myself that it was always, a, education was it. That was it, you know, no matter what, you're gonna go and you're gonna be educated, you're gonna be a doctor. That was it, that was it. Went to dental school, that was it. So I had that stuff down my throat, okay? But uh, that is the way the Greek people are. They want their children and they'll sacrifice for their children. So I know that runs in all Greek families, that really does. Now, the only thing I wanna just mention here is uh, our time is just about up. Uh, I think we've got a few minutes left. But this book has uh, inspired uh, the historical society. You've got the attention of the, you know, the Carroll County Historical Society. So I want you to tell us what's coming up with that. Okay. They've asked us to do an exhibit as part of a broader picture of immigration into the United States. Who are the people who made communities here? And we're going to do an exhibit on September the 23rd, which is part of Fall Fest. And we're going to feature the Greek community that was formed here in Westminster. So the book started with 10 families, and we realized as we went on, there was a second story here. It was not a collection of 10 little stories. It was that the people who came here formed a new community. What did they bring to the community? And what we learned was that they had a sense of pride in their culture that they came from, the Greek history, the Greek religion, the Greek food, the Greek culture, at the same time, they wanted to be Americans, and they were Americans. And we have a catalog of the military, the Greek families in Westminster who served in World Wars I, II, and continue to serve today. We have all their pictures in there. They became part of the community here. And so that's the immigration story, just told through the 10 families that we inventoried, is coming in, assimilating, keeping the old culture, and being proud of it, but becoming part of the new culture and being actively involved in it. So we're going to uh, go to Emerald Hill, our old city hall, and there are four little rooms. We're going to show the businesses that they had, where they came from, and the two different cultures. And we're excited about it. The Historical Society will write the graphics illustrating the different points, and all of us are bringing things from Greece, from our homes, um, we have rugs, we have um, Greek vases, we have a HEPA hat memberships. Uh, we have food, yes indeed, we We're have, gonna food. have food. We're th working on that one. You hear that, Jim? We're gonna have <laughs> Greek food, you got that? Anyway, he'll be there. <laughs> Could you tell them the story of the HEPA, which is an interesting link to America? No, I did not. Um, that's one organization where I have always tried to um, I never got myself, I mean this interview is about you, but I personally never really appreciated my culture until I got into areas of higher learning. And when I went to UMBC and I'm, I actually majored in ancient studies and classical Greek, I just realized what a contribution to civilization my heritage had. So, um, I, when I, you know, when I, I wanted to get become a part of it when I grew up 
when I, you know, I came back to the community. So I joined the, uh, the order of HEPA, which is the American Hellenic Educational Progressive Association. It's a fraternal organization. It's a fraternal organization, and the interesting fact is that it was formed in 1922. The reason it was formed was to combat the Ku Klux Klan. It was formed in Atlanta, Georgia in 1922 by, I think there were, I don't know, seven, maybe eight men. One of them, from what I gather, had actually infiltrated the Klan. But uh, like a, a lot of cultures, the, you know, the, 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 the Greek American was resented in the beginning. And so this organization got together in order to unite themselves and to combat, combat that. And um, well, they succeeded. We're here. To me, the hate organizations hopefully are on the way out and AHEP is on the way up. The Greek right. community is on the way up. So that's what that is. I love it. Well, Dr. Griffin has one thing he's brought that we're very proud of. We named him as an honorary Greek for organizing and getting our group together. So would you show that? So as the honorary Greek, my Greek name is Konstantinos Papagriffinos. Yeah. There you go. How about that? All right. Let's, let's, uh, let's get a view on that. All right. There we go. There we so go. I, go, oh. I guess Signed all the by all the Greeks. All the privileges of being a Greek. Uh, Absolutely. 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 We're starting with drinking ouzo. That's right. <laughs> and and, uh, and uh, going down to the Icaros restaurant. Absolutely. Too, we know Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Well, listen, it's been a real pleasure. Um, uh, I, it, for me, it's been a real pleasure and a real privilege to get involved with this project and this book. And... Um, I originally did not feel like a part of it, okay? Because to me, uh, I came here to Westminster in, when I got out of the military in 1977. And that's when I came to Westminster. So I felt like a newbie. I didn't go back with all these other families like the Cyrenacuses, the Samioses, Lefteruses, Amprasus, Lutris, all that. I didn't go back with that. But then uh, I was encouraged by Dr. Griffin, oh, what are you doing feeling that way? What are you talking about? And then, and then Antigone told me, she says, you know, you've, you know, you, you've got to start from where you're at and you are here. So in any way, long story short, I did find out of all the things that my mother's mother came to Westminster to, and his sponsor was his, his uh, cousin, Pete Samuels. So... I mean, it brought out a relationship I never knew existed. But the bottom line is this. Uh, I didn't come here until 1977, but I've lived here in Westminster longer than most of the Greeks. You follow what I'm saying? Yep. Because they may have lived here 20 or 30 years, and then they moved to Baltimore, they got married, and all that. So I could say, well, I've, you know, I came here late, but I lived here longer. Is that Pete Samios, the same Samios that was the first commander of the American Legion? Here in town. Yes. There you go. That's she knows that. Him. She knows that. So anyway, I saw someone had the ship's manifest, again, my grandfather's name, who I knew nothing about because he died when my, uh, my mother was just about two years old. And, uh, you know, her brother was in the womb and he died. And so I, we never knew him. I never knew him. And then I found out, I put his name on this and he came here because I was questioning that because he was from the island of Kithara, which is the same island that, that uh, Samuel's family is from. came from. And so then I find on there that uh, <clears throat> he's coming, that uh, this person came to Westminster and was sponsored by a cousin, Pete Samuels. And Westminster gave his address on Main Street. So anyway, it made me appreciate it more. But this is just, I just want to tell you, this is just a fantastic work. It is and some of the war stories and everything are just, just absolutely great. So if, okay, we've got this thing coming up in September. Will you hopefully have any books available there? Yes, we'll have some books there. Okay, all right, because and I know they also, have been selling. And we're bringing, there are three families that have World War II letters, and they are bringing the originals, and they're going to showcase them, um, among other things. It's just, it's gonna be fun. I will say one thing that I would urge anyone watching, listening, or thinking about this. Please 
take all the photographs that you're taking and put names and dates on them. You don't care right now, but your children and your grandchildren one day will want to find these things. And they'll say, who's that in the picture? What year was that taken? It is so hard to do the research and have to guess by clothing styles and whatever. But you owe it to the next generation. And most young people aren't interested in this kind of research at an early age. You have to get to your 60s and 70s and 80s to even start thinking about it. And then you can't ask your grandparents. So get those grandparents to write down what they say, get the stories down, and hopefully you can pass on. We now feel so good because we're passing these on to our grandchildren. And I'm hoping that this will, will stimulate interest in other Absolutely. ethnic groups here Absolutely. in the community. So it's really great. Listen, I want to thank you both so much. I want to thank you so much for coming. Dean, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for the years of service that you've had for, to me and my family. Okay, I want to thank you for that. I felt like you've kept me going sometimes at times when I probably didn't deserve it. So anyway, I want to thank you for that. And, uh, and Antigone, I really, really want to thank you very, very much. And uh, we really do appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank I appreciate you. It's been that. my privilege. Okay. Thank you.